Whose car is it? Lots of people wind up in traffic court at one time or another. Most people just pay their tickets to avoid going there in the first place. Most of the rest wind up paying no matter what their defense might be. However, an obstinate few will bring up their rights recognized by the Constitution as a part of their defense, sometimes in relation to the actual charge, sometimes in relation to the way the court handles the case itself. My advice? Don't bother bringing up the Constitution in traffic court. Why? Because in my opinion, the Constitution is irrelevant. More than once, I've heard people tell stories of exasperated judges warning the Hosees appearing in that court that if they mention the Constitution one more time, they'd be found in contempt of court. How could the Constitution not be relevant in a court, you ask? Well, if the case at hand was a matter of law and it involved your property and you weren't involved in a star chamber slash extortion meal proceeding, the Constitution might be relevant. Unfortunately for you, traffic cases don't involve law. It doesn't involve your property, and when entering traffic court, you've stepped onto a conveyor belt designed and operated to part you from your money. The astute observer will have noticed at least two issues in that last statement that don't jibe with conventional thought. Allow me to examine them in a little detail. Are you sure it's your car? The first issue is whether this traffic incident actually involves what you think is your property, your car. But are you sure it's your car? You bought the car, brand spanking new from your local dealer, and finally paid off the banknote. What a nice feeling to get that envelope in the mail with the certificate of title marked paid. Ah, it's Miller time. But before you get too comfortable and break out the potato chips, let's look at what happens over the last 48 months. When you bought the car, what did you do? You wrote a check for the down payment. When the car arrived at the dealer's lot, you wanted to drive it now, so you let the dealer title it with the state. Naturally, since you still owe a lot of money on that car, the bank got the certificate of title until you paid off the loan. Stop. Think about what just happened. What's a Federal Reserve note? First, you cut a down payment check to be paid in Federal Reserve notes. Since I started talking about the Constitution, let's examine what Federal Reserve notes are. First, I'll tell you what they aren't. They aren't money. They may be legal tender for all debts, public and private, but they aren't money. Debts can only be paid with money, lawful money. In other words, gold and silver coins of the United States of America per Title 12, United States Code, subsection 152. Justice Department looks to stamp out constitutional alternatives to the Fed by Pat Shanahan. Following the Justice Department's recent announcement that it is lowering the boom on alternative money, the debate over what constitutes real currency in the United States is back in the national spotlight. The federal government is claiming paying for goods and services with liberty dollars is a crime. However, NORFED, the producer of both redeemable currency and one ounce silver rounds, called Liberty Dollars, for the past eight years disputes this. NORFED has recommended its system as a boost for people who are looking for an inflation-proof currency to protect their purchasing power. U.S. Mint spokeswoman Becky Bailey said the Liberty Dollar coins share some resemblances to real money, such as the term trust in God instead of in God we trust, and the use of a torch in the design. But we don't want consumers to be fooled. Such similarities may confuse people into thinking the money is real. Supporters of backing currency with gold and silver say the federal government's verbal attack is nothing more than a hollow threat and but one more effort to move Americans' attention away from the collapsing paper dollar. So who is fooling whom? There is enough legal precedent out there which says U.S. currency should be backed by commodities. Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution says, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. It has never been repealed. The Coinage Act of 1792 defined the dollar as a measurement of gold and silver, 25.5 grains and 412.5 grains respectively, thereby setting the ratio of value at 16 to 1. In addition, Title 12 United States Code 152 says, 
the terms lawful money and lawful money of the United States shall be construed to mean gold and silver coin of the United States. This is a federal law still on the books, yet no coins from the U.S. Mint have contained any silver since 1968. The production of gold coins ceased in 1933 with FDR's confiscation statutes. The first non-redeemable Federal Reserve notes were issued in 1963 without the then-familiar clause in the upper left-hand corner. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or any Federal Reserve Bank. But lawful money was defined in Title 12 United States Code 152 above. The old redeemable notes circulated together with the new frauds or Federal Reserve accounting unit dollars, so-called by monetary realists and Republican Ron Paul, Republican in Texas, for nearly five years until the banks refused to redeem any paper notes for silver after June 24, 1968. Then the bona fide notes were gradually collected by the banks and taken out of circulation. Silver currently sells for over 10 frauds per ounce. The new notes, now deceptive misnomer, as a note by legal definition, must be payable in something, claimed to be the entity rather than the receipt for the entity. And the hoax was complete. Now the government could fund itself and not have to depend upon the constitutional taxes by apportionment. After several reprintings and design changes, these are still the same Federal Reserve notes that Miss Bailey is proclaiming to be real money in 2006. Can anyone other than a government bureaucrat make such an outlandish statement with a straight face? So you didn't really pay off that loan. You merely discharged that debt with a negotiable instrument of debt Federal Reserve notes. So you didn't really pay that debt. You merely discharged it. If you really didn't pay for your car, how can you claim to own it? It was your car, sort of. The next thing you did was let the dealer title your car since you wanted to drive that new car off the lot now, not later. What exactly happens there? The dealer took the manufacturer's statement of origin, the MSO, which was the first piece of paper constituting legal evidence of ownership of the car, and gave it to the state. Think about that. Here you are, authorizing the dealer to take the only evidence of ownership associated with that car and donate it to the government. What does the state give the dealer in return for that document of ownership? They give him a certificate of title. Evidence that a title exists, but not the title itself, and not a document showing that you have the actual absolute right, title, and interest in that car. Huh? You got a piece of paper that has your name on it, their name on it, and the word owner is next to your name. You own it, right? Wrong. The certificate of title is merely evidence that a title exists. Someone in the state government has signed a document that certifies that a title exists somewhere. Hence, the document is called a certificate of title rather than a title. There are a dozen different ways to legally define ownership, but the one we're concerned with here involves the bare legal ownership in the form of a possessory right. You may have physical possession of the car, but that doesn't necessarily mean you own it the way you think of the concept of ownership. What is the true title for that car? The manufacturer's statement of origin, the MSO, an actual attested legal document prepared by the manufacturer stating that they created the car, manufactured it, and therefore own it until they sell it. The next owner can prove his true ownership of the car in law by possession of the MSO and a bill of sale. What was the document showing ownership or title of the car during the time between when the manufacturer built and owned it and the dealer sold it to you? The MSO. If the MSO is only an indication of what type of car it is, what year it was made, or other sundry descriptive information, why would the state be so concerned with receiving and retaining it? If the MSO is not legal title, why wouldn't simply showing the MSO to the state suffice? Why is the state so concerned that the certificate of title be printed on archival grade, fraud-resistant, security-featured document paper, the kind normally reserved for legal documents like stock certificates and titles to homes and land? Why do they insist on the delivery and retention of the original MSO? Why wouldn't a court-certified copy do? Or an official notice from the manufacturer? 
Isn't the point of the MSO to simply to show that the car that was delivered to you was new and that you own it? In fact, if you march down to a court reporter slash notary public slash judge with a dealer and have the reporter slash authority certify under oath that the MSO that you hold is the original, have the dealer affirm under oath in an affidavit that he delivered the original MSO to you, and you then bring a court certified copy of that MSO to the Department of Motor Vehicles to title it, they still won't take it. Why? Because they need the original MSO to affect a transfer of actual title to them to the state. They then issue you a certificate of title, which merely evidences that a transfer took place, that an actual title does exist, and that while they hold actual title and therefore legal ownership of the car, you have bare legal possession of the car. So who was it that really owns your car? Your car goes into a trust. Okay, so now the state owns your car. So what? Well, here's what. What's the first thing you let that dealer do after you got your car titled? He registered it. What's wrong with that? You have to understand how registration affects the status of property, and you have to understand the concept of trust. A trust is a situation where property is held by a legal entity for the benefit of another. The property may or may not be in the physical possession of a trustee of the trust. No matter who has physical possession of the property, it is subject to the terms of the trust. Anyone having physical possession of trust assets has a fiduciary duty to maintain or improve the assets of that trust for the benefit of whoever holds interest in the trust. The terms of a trust are its constitution. While the federal constitution involves law, the terms of a trust involves private law or contract law that will be litigated in courts of equity. Incidentally, who owns and operates the courts of equity? The same state that owns legal title to your car. Should we be surprised if the state court routinely ruled in favor of the state? What is required to create a trust? Massachusetts law is probably representative of most state laws on trust creation. In Massachusetts, there are three legal requirements to create a trust. Number one, a written transfer of the property to another person containing a description of the property. Number two, the names of at least three parties involved. A, creator slash transferrer of the trust. B, custodial trustee of the trust. C, beneficiary of the trust. And number three, an evidencing of the creation of a trust by registration of the property. Check it out. According to the Massachusetts General Laws, Section 2, Uniform Custodial Trust Act, subsection 1852, generally, creation. A person may create a custodial trust of property by written transfer of the property to another person, evidenced by registration or by other instrument of transfer, executed in any lawful manner, naming as beneficiary an individual who may be the transferrer in which the transfer E is designated in substance as custodial trustee. Page 95, emphasis added. If you read section 18.52 carefully, you'll notice two terms that are easily misunderstood or overlooked, person and individual. The average person wouldn't dream that the meanings of person or individual could include government, but the average person could be wrong. Both person and individual can be used to identify a legal fiction such as a corporate state government. Look them up in Black's Law Dictionary to see what I mean. Individual. Adjective. Since one. Existing as an indivisible entity. Since two. Of or relating to a single person or thing as opposed to a group. What we are concerned here with is the first sense. An indivisible entity. Entity. An organization such as a business or a governmental unit that has a legal identity apart from its members. Notice also that the creation of the trust is evidenced by registration of the property. What did you do with that car after you gave the title to the state? You registered it. By registering the car, you effectively created a trust wherein the state owns legal title to the car and you merely retain equitable title, possession. The Uniform Custodial Trust Act continues. 
A person may create a custodial trust of property by a written declaration, evidenced by registration of the property, or by other instrument of declaration executed in any lawful manner, describing the property and naming as beneficiary an individual other than the declarant. A registration or other declaration of trust for the sole benefit of the declarant will not constitute a custodial trust. Title to custodial trustee property will be in the custodial trustee and the beneficial interest will be in the beneficiary. Any person may augment existing custodial trust property by the addition of other property pursuant to the act. The Uniform Custodial Act will not displace or restrict other means of creating trust. A trust whose terms do not conform to the act may be enforceable according to its terms under other law. Notice also this section. C-201, Section 1, Transfer to Statutory Custodianship Trustee. An adult person may, during his lifetime, transfer any property owned by him in any manner otherwise consistent with law to one or more named persons designated, in substance, as a statutory custodianship trustee. Such transfer shall be sufficient to greater trust upon the terms set forth in this chapter as it is in effect at the date of the transfer without any further trust instrument or designation of terms and without appointment or qualification by any court and shall be complete upon acceptance of the trust by the trustees or trustees manifested in any form. The trustee or trustees shall serve without giving bond or surety unless the transferor by written instrument or the probate court upon the application of any person interested in the estate of the transferor and upon good cause shown shall provide for a bond. All transfers and trusts under this chapter shall be revocable by the transferor at any time he has legal capacity by writing signed by him and delivered to the person or, if more than one, to any person serving as trustee. Thus it appears to me that after donating the title, the manufacturer's statement of origin, to your car, to the state, a constructive trust is created. But don't take my word for it. Look up the exact definition of constructive trust in a law dictionary. Constructive trust, an equitable remedy that a court imposes against one who has obtained property by wrongdoing. A constructive trust imposed to prevent unjust enrichment creates no fiduciary relationship. Despite its name, it is not a trust at all. Compare resulting trust, also termed implied trust, involuntary trust, trust de son tort, Trust ex delicto, trust ex moficio, remedial trust, trust invitum. See trustee de son tort under trustee. Compare resulting trust. Cases trust, pages 91 through 111, Corpus Juris Secundi, Troven Conversion, subsections 10, 12, pages 174 through 201. A constructive trust is the formula through which the conscience of equity finds expression. When property has been acquired in such circumstances that the holder of the legal title may not in good conscience retain the beneficial interest, equity converts him into a trustee. Beatty versus T. Guttenheim Exploration Company. It is sometimes said that when there are sufficient grounds for imposing a constructive trust, the court constructs a trust. The expression is, of course, absurd. The word constructive is derived from the verb construe not from the verb construct. The court construes the circumstances in the sense that it explains or interprets them. It does not construct them. Austin W. Scott and William F. Frackner, The Law of Trust, subsection 462.4, fourth edition, 1987. You have unwittingly succumbed to the deceit of the manufacturer, dealer, and state government and transferred title, manufacturer's statement of origin, to property you supposedly own to the state or its agent. You then register the property, which is all that is necessary to create a trust. Remember that it says, A person may create a custodial trust of property by a written declaration, evidenced by registration of the property or by other instrument of decoration executed in any lawful manner, describing the property and naming as beneficiary an individual other than the decorant. Remember, the registration wouldn't constitute the creation of a trust if the document only had your name on it. See item 96 above. Usually, the title and registration application and document have A. Your name 
B, the name of the state and motor vehicle agency representing the state you're dealing with. And finally, C, the signature and or seal of the head of that agency. So there are the requisite number of entities or persons named on the document to create a trust. You unknowingly created the trust by transferring legal title, but not possession, equitable title, of the property to the agency head named on the certificate of title slash registration. Usually this person's signature or seal is included on the document. Take a look at yours and see. The state slash DMV agency names you as owner, although you have ownership in the form of bare legal possession of the car. You don't have all right, title, and interest in the car, just bear legal possession. As beneficiary to this auto trust, you are also placed in a fiduciary capacity to make sure that your car is well-maintained and operated safely under the rules of the owner's state. You go to court and... So what happens when you get a ticket for a defective taillight? You start whining that nobody was hurt and, under the Constitution, the common law says that there has to be an injured party and you demand the state produce the injured party. Whereupon the judge says, shut up and don't mention the Constitution again or I'll throw you in jail for contempt. You're scratching your head, but the judge is right. He's enforcing the terms of a constructive trust that you helped to create. Trust are private contractual agreements and operate outside of the law and generally have nothing to do with the Constitution. I want to pause right here and once again emphasize the need to understand the difference between public and private. You have so many constitutionalists out there that uh, promulgate or uh, proselytize this notion that the Constitution is all-encompassing and covers everything, and it doesn't. The Constitution is on the public side. It's a trust document. It creates government and it restrains government. Um, it has nothing to do with the private side. And contract law is on the private side. This is why you have in the Constitution, it says that they, can, uh, that they cannot make any law that will infringe on the obligations of contract. So you have to understand that they are operating outside the Constitution through contracts because contract law operates outside of the Constitution. As you can see, constitutional law is on the public side and contract law is on the private side. This should be very simple for people to understand, but it's only because people do not understand the difference of public and private that they keep bringing up these constitutional arguments. It's not going to work. It's not. It demonstrates a lack of understanding of the law. Thus, your constitutional defense was irrelevant. You have a fiduciary duty to the owner's state to keep that car in tip-top shape, and you screwed up when you let the taillight burn out on the car the state had been kind enough to let you use. It doesn't matter that nobody was hurt, and the judge will toss your butt in the can if you keep bringing up the demand common law and constitution. Homework. There's one last thing the sharper readers may have noticed. The end of C, 201 C, section 1 reads, all transfers and trusts under this chapter shall be revocable by the transferor at any time he has legal capacity by writing signed by him and delivered to the person or, if more than one, to any person serving as trustee. Here's today's homework assignment. Figure out, number one, what it means to have legal capacity, number two, what it is that you have to say in the writing, and number three, to whom you have to present your legal writing. Hint. Search American Jurisprudence, Volume 2. If you can learn how to revoke the transfers under the auto trust to your car, you might be able to regain legal title and real ownership to your car. There's one other tactic that might defeat the judge's solid judicial notice and presumption of trust. Let's say you return your certificate of title to the state along with your registration, utilizing the forms prescribed for that purpose. You can't very well claim that you own your car when you're holding evidence that the state owns it in your wallet. And truth, the certificate of title and registration don't prove you do own your car. They prove you don't. What if you were to then to publish a legal notice three times over three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of wide circulation in your area that looks something like this? Parties claiming interest in properties. Number one, 2018 Dodge Challenger, VIN number 12345678 and so forth. And or number two, a 2018 Chevrolet Camaro, VIN number 
and so forth. Must state entries by March 30th, 2019 by replying at Box 1234, Any County, News, Any Town, TA. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, the term interest means, but is not limited to, number one, an instrument of security by hypothecation, number two, claim, adverse, equitable, legal, marketable, number three, interest, adverse, equitable, legal, four, ownership, adverse, equitable, legal, possessory, five, right, adverse, equitable, legal, possessory, six, presumption by statute, Seven, subject by trust, constructive, desuntort, ex delecto, ex malficio, implied, involuntary. Eight, title, adverse, equitable, legal, marketable. Nine, interest resulting by trust defined in law, private, public, international, federal, general laws of the People's Republic of Taxachusetts statutes. Ten, subject of bankruptcy. Eleven, Interest by operation of law, private, public, international, federal, general laws of the People's Republic of Taxachusetts statutes, 12, lien or encumbrance. Then, if you were stopped for a ticket, what would happen if you motioned a court for a declaratory judgment stating that by virtue of no claims of interest being stated pursuant by your notice, you have absolute right, title, and interest in those properties? Do you think they submit evidence that they actually own your and everyone else's car to refute your claim of ownership? They might, but would they? A final notice for those annoying constitutionalists. For all those constitutionalists who have the timidity to think that they have a right to travel with their private property without first getting permission from the state, remember that the judge always takes silent judicial notice that you're driving one of the state's cars, regardless of whether the registration is current or even exists or whether you return their certificate of title. Until you regain the MSO or get their court to recognize that your car is, in fact, and in their law, yours, you're just whistling Dixie. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like more videos like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell at the bottom of the screen so you can get more in-depth information only here right on High Frequency Radio. Peace to the gods.